In 2019, Mojang released a series of experimental snapshots aimed at reviewing the entire combat system of the game. They did this again in 2022 with the Elytra, and now we see them taking aim at Mending and the entire village trading system that leads up to it, which raises the obvious question, why are Mojang dead set on making old features weaker, and more importantly, is this why they're so cautious about adding new things now? There's a big list of broken Minecraft mechanics that they'd like to go through and fix, and today we'll be going through that entire thing while also explaining the story behind why it's important to fix in Mojang's eyes because I think they have very different opinions to the rest of us here but with that said please do like this video and consider subscribing if you do that to videos that you like but with that said let's jump straight into what the problem actually is Cave Game, or Minecraft as it was later known, was developed by a sole creator who was responsible not just for the implementation, but also for the vision of the entire project. This makes a big difference because all sorts of features that aren't feasible early on can be stored in the chamber for later. This isn't just a theory I have, it's something that is backed up by the fact that the first tech demo for Cave Game which was released, the Minecraft Alpha if you will, was released on this forum where Notch said that later he wanted to have a creative mode and a survival mode. What do you know, the end game has a creative mode, uh, where you have infinite materials and build without delay, and a survival mode where you have single player or cooperative health bars and needing to eat in order to stay healthy. These ideas, which were had very early on, could be followed through much later, and even the idea of having an end goal for it is something we did see first in October of 2011 with this very blocky silhouette, but then eventually in the full release with the Ender Dragon that we all know and love. Although she shows her love to me in some very weird ways, but the same thing is true for this potentially game breaking idea that Notch had, where he said it would delay the game by at least two months. It's a major rewrite to the entire thing, but he thinks he can add infinitely large maps. When you start the game, only the area nearest, nearest to the player could be generated, and then when you move closer to the edge, it could generate more map, while the areas you move away from get saved to the disk instead of being in fresh memory. This would allow Minecraft to not have a limited world of 256 by 256, which almost every other block building game uses, but instead go infinitely large. This is a revolutionary idea on par with that of the original Super Mario Bros, which worked out that although you're drawing a whole new frame every second, almost every detail is the same as before, so you just delete the line of pixels on the left and draw a new one on the right before moving everything to the left, and all of a sudden the side-scrolling platformer could be born. The same thing happened with Minecraft because of this. But it's not just an incredible technical innovation, which clearly hadn't existed before then, it was also a very clever opportunity for Notch to work out benefits to the system, and the ones he gives are you would never run out of space, you'd never run out of resources, travel between several planes of existence, so hell could be a real plane you could visit, and the moon too, possibly, and to be fair, there is a moon dimension in Minecraft, it just has a slightly different name, uh, also there could be NPC villages and monster towns, truly epic sized multiplayer servers lasting for a long time, I'm sure Hytel are very happy uh, that he had that last one in mind, but yeah, look at all of these ideas and you'll see that yes, they did add NPC villages, it was announced on Google Plus of all places, and although they look very different, this was something which only made sense because the world's were aren't so limited. You could explore and eventually find one of these, and the same thing is true for the Never. Having the Never be on a tiny plane of existence would kind of suck. This isn't a theoretical question if you play console edition like me, because of course the 284 by 284 Never was ridiculously tiny and made it far too easy to find a Never Fortress while also making sure there'd only ever be one. Having these super limited size other planes of existence just didn't really work. The same is true for the Moon, as Minecraft likes to call it, but these foreshadowing of previous events is something most Mojang did a lot when it was just one person, because the same person who's working on the really hard technical challenges could also be the person whose interest it is in making the game the best it humanly can be. This is of course a stark contrast to the modern day Minecraft, where the people who develop the ideas are not just different to the people who work on them day to day, but those people are different yet to the people who actually do the marketing. This results in a huge difference between what Minecraft markets in their trailers, and what they deliver in the updates people can download. There are so many more people with their hands in the pie, with their fingers in the pot, with their uh, soup in the bowl, is that a phrase, uh, that are now having to make these updates, and obviously this results in a lot of improvements in the scale of what could be done, but also results in a loss of refinement in what exactly is done in terms of the end result. Take bartering for example, a brand new mechanic added in the Never update, which is a way to trade gold with piglins and get great rewards in return. It's a very weird system because I've never been into a shop where you give them money and then they give you the random item afterwards. Usually you get 
get to pick what you're buying, but not with these guys. And so the idea is actually quite fun. You get a random item and that random item can be fairly small or it could be very powerful. The powerful examples were a Neverite Ho and an Ender Pearl. These were brand new ways to obtain these new items, but they were very, very unlikely. So they were balanced in for a certain percentage chance given that you can't really do much and you can only get one trade every eight seconds. Then it goes to a team who works on implementing them, who of course adds in a very balanced table as they originally had. However, there is a couple of extra fun features in there, such as when you mine a gold block, a trade instantly happens. Whether this is a bug or an intentional feature, it's hard to be sure, but this sounds really great on the surface, but actually messes with the balance that was decided by the people who worked out the feature in the first place. Now take it a step even further and look at the trailer for this update. As you can see, about 34 seconds in, they approach some piglins who are standing together very intimidatingly as a crowd in a little bit of a hangout where they've got some lanterns chilling. This is a very cool little situation they've got, and when you offer them the wrong item, something bad happens, something so bad it literally kills Steve here, which makes him realize he has to go back and give them gold. This is a really cool looking mechanic in the trailer, which doesn't match how the game designers intended, which also doesn't match how the game came out, which is why when 1.16 came out, it was considered so easy to get Ender Pearls via the bartering that this was the only way anyone did it. And so Mojang had to quickly nerf the system, which they did in 1.16.2 or 1.16.100 for Bedrock. Don't ask me why it's such a big difference in numbers. Uh, but then looking at that, they nerfed the trades entirely back to what makes sense given the new mechanics in there. But this feels like a huge nerf, even though it's actually them just trying to bring the system closer to how it was originally. When you have lots of different teams with slightly different goals and slightly different visions, it's really hard to make sure they work on adding the same feature. I used bartering as an example, but you can also look at the uh, Buzzy Bees update, which was very fun and just added bees. It was meant to be a fairly small one, but at the same time, the trailer had this really cool waterfall the bees were going to fly over, implying it was going to change the world gen in a serious way, which technically it was changing the world gen. If you had a tree that looked like this before, there was a 5% chance it would look like this now. But you get the point that the difference between expectations and reality is one of the big things that leads to discontent across all walks of life. And one of the biggest ways to inflame that is by giving people something which they think is fun and balanced or a powerful reward for doing something in Minecraft and then saying, oh, whoa, we didn't want it to be that powerful. Look how much fun you're having. Let's let's quickly nerf that and bring that back. So I think the more important question to ask is not do Mojang need to nerf things? Obviously with the current pattern of development they do, but instead how have they nerfed things successfully in a way that hasn't caused community revolt? You might be surprised to learn this given the community's reaction to even small changes to the Iron Golem or the way that the world generates or even villager trading that actually there have been nerfs that were pulled off in history that made Minecraft harder that were actively well received but there are actually several examples and an easy one would be ladders which fun fact Notch himself said originally were something he did not want in Minecraft at all. Ladders are never fun, they're not fun in Minecraft either but they are a good utility. It's an easy way to get straight up without having stairs going back and forth. So we added them anyway because the fans convinced him and honestly when they were first added They were much more powerful because you could ladder every other block only one part of your model had to touch uh, Ladders which meant this really fun half ladder system developed But this was nerfed in beta 1.5 where you now had to use a ladder spaced evenly Which is how ladders work in the real world But still it is a nerf to ladders which was received fine by the community The same thing is true for the golden apple and the enchanted golden apple even more powerfully than that The enchanted golden apple used to be crafted using eight golden golden ingots and an apple before being nerfed down to eight golden blocks and an apple that is nine times the cost and then finally being made something found only in chess. This is a huge nerf to the item which was well received and the same is true for sharpness. Sharpness used to be a lot more powerful but the attack damage buff that it gives is reduced drastically in modern day Minecraft after the combat update. Also which you know was not well received has to be said that update contained a lot of nerfs that were not well received at all and maybe a lot of people are still playing. 1.8 specifically because of that but the sharpness thing by itself went down just fine and the same is true for breeding. Breeding used to have no cooldown whatsoever. You could breed as many times as you had food but it was limited to every five minutes on the Java edition and every one minute on bedrock and this is something which is accepted as a fine part of the game. What is it that these nerfs have in common I think is an interesting question that you need to ask to work out how Mojang can better adjust the game and I think the answer to it is obviously some of them are very old Minecraft 
Minecraft was not a fully formed game before it officially released, and so some of these changes being made early into a feature's lifespan are seen as just, yeah, they're just changing the game very slightly, whereas later on in the game's lifespan, these things are made much harder. When Minecraft released fully, it came with an expectation that lots of the things you're used to would stay in the game, but yet still they managed to nerf the Enchanted Golden Apple and get away with it, and this is because I think all players agree it feels overpowered. It doesn't just feel uh, like good, it doesn't just feel strong, it feels insane that anyone who has enough gold, or realistically a gold farm, has access to the infinite amounts of healing which Enchanted Golden Apples could provide, especially when they were stacked. So I think either doing something early on, uh, uh, you know, that's a very important thing, but the other important thing is doing something that feels fair. I think this also applies to the sharpness nerf. By nerfing sharpness, they allow more choices in what you actually put on your sword, which makes sharpness feel like a choice and not something that's mandatory. I think people would feel the same way about nerfing protection, or rather buffing fire protection, as well as projectile protection and blast protection. Making everything feel like a decent decision, making it feel like you have choices, is something players generally do like if those choices sound like ones they'd like to make. Taking things away from people is never that fun. Taking the future possibilities away from people is fine if you give them better alternatives, is how I would say you can take these nerfs. Uh, breeding is the one weird exception where, honestly, it just feels weird that you used to be able to breed anything instantly, including snow golems, by the way. But yeah, uh, if you look at nerfs, I think that is the one common thread. And so looking at Minecraft's history, you can kind of see how as it develops, they run into this problem of these two worlds colliding, where people expect their current worlds to work the same they have because each update is getting smaller, while demanding bigger updates which are being made by different people. And so what does this create? Broadly speaking, since 1.0 came out and Minecraft officially released 12 years ago, we've seen two classes of Minecraft update. There are the smaller updates, which focus on a few small features, and the bigger updates. To use Intel terminology, there are tick and there are tock updates. Tick updates are much more focused on a small set of the game and can be really well balanced to apply just a few small features, which objectively do make Minecraft better. Take the horse update, for example, or the frostburn update, or even to go more recently, the buzzy bees. These added well balanced balanced features, but they didn't generate the buzz and excitement that you might expect. I'm sorry for the bee pun. I, I, I shouldn't have done it, I know. But, uh, you know, this didn't generate the excitement and hype that you might have gotten. Whereas when you look at the TOC updates, they add such huge swaths of content uh, that honestly it would be hard for something not to be a little broken. Take a look at the entire enchantment system and try and tell me something's not weird there. Take a look at the combat update or even the never update and you really quickly understand how adding so many new systems to the game does create much much more excitement, does sell many more copies of Minecraft, but does create the problem of how to perfectly balance them. If you assume that Mojang wants to have perfect game balance, then it's really important that when they add horses to the game, they don't make boats and minecarts obsolete. If you assume this is their goal, when they add a new type of weapon to the game, it's important to make sure that it's hard enough to get, that it doesn't overpower everything before it, and when they add bartering, it's important that this doesn't remove the need for trading with villagers. This is a fairly hard thing to balance when you're talking about individual mechanic and making sure that the millions of people who experience it actually do feel like they're both worthwhile, but it gets much harder when you take an entire system which is being revamped. Take the Never update for example, this isn't just adding bartering to the game and the piglins that come with it, it's also adding a new way to swim across lava in the form of the strider, it's adding a new couple types of woods which can be found in this dimension, a new way to respawn here, a new set of biomes with their pluses, their negatives, and their new resources that can be gathered, and indeed a new way to prevent full damage, all of these different items need to not just be added to the game willy-nilly, but they need to be carefully considered against the existing alternatives. Every single item I just mentioned does have an alternative to it, although obviously that excludes the strider because there's no other way to go over lava, except the exact same goal of getting across lava lakes could be accomplished by flying if you've been to the end, and if you haven't you could use ender pearls. Should you use an ender pearl or should you get a saddle and get your strider going, that is a decision that you actually need to consider and ideally the game makes it so that it's not so powerful to use a strider that you'd never use those other forms of transport, but also not so weak to use a strider that you'd never use a strider if you had any access to something else. This is something they also have to do for the new biomes. They need to make sure that it's not so good to survive in the nether that people don't come back to the earth world, and they need to make sure that it's not so hostile here that no one ever uses the respawn anchor. And to be totally honest with you, I don't think most people do use the respawn anchor out of actual wanting to live in the nether, 
for any reason besides challenge. And that is something which you could argue they got wrong. So there is a really important level of balance, which I think in these small updates, Mojang gets really, really right. There is nothing in the Frostburn update you could argue is overpowered because there's nothing in the Frostburn update you could argue is really that good. But to prove the point with even one of these tiny updates, which no one looks back on favorably, uh, we could say that the Frostburn update actually adds magma. This is a really nice halfway house between fire and uh, lava. You can get damaged on it, but it encourages you to crouch, making the never a more interesting place to traverse later. But even for just your builds, you can have this middle ground and it's a really cool glowing block too. Also, the polar bears make the frost biomes feel just a little bit more alive, while the red never brick might be one of the least used blocks in Minecraft, but it's a really cool idea to encourage you to use your never warts. And I think red never brick is something we should use more. Okay, you know, what? from this whole video right now, I'm encouraged to go down that little part of the tech tree. Encouraging people to go down these paths to do different things is a really good example of balance. But like we said, if you look at some of these updates, spending months considering how to balance every feature perfectly is nowhere near as fun as just saying, here's a ton of features, have at them. So where is the balance in game balance, you might ask? I think the obvious answer is do everything all at once. The perfect Minecraft update is a really easy one to imagine. You add huge swaths of new content that's really good and players want to explore and use it, but also doesn't devalue players' existing stuff. It's good enough that you want to explore new chunks and find it, but not so good that it makes existing players' worlds feel pointless, and you need to make sure you do all of that in a really short time frame, because obviously people can't wait forever, while still making sure that it's perfectly quality controlled and there are no bugs. Obviously, in a world of no trade-off, that is exactly what Mojang would do. However, in the real world, there are trade-offs in every single decision, and so for every additional feature they add, they need to take a little bit of balancing away. For every piece of balancing they add, they need to do a little bit less bug fixing, and for every ounce of bug fixing they do, they make a slightly smaller update. Unless they don't make a smaller update, in which case I guess they could release it later. Unless they don't want to release it later, in which case they could overwork their staff more and have a huge controversy by pretending that they're such a progressive company in Sweden, but also overworking their employees and having massive overtime required. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of trade-offs that could be made, and although there are lots of easy ones to make as an individual, trying to work out how to square these circles to make an overall update is actually quite hard. But even if you don't empathize with the struggle, and I think it's a valid point to say, yeah, they are a trillion dollar company, they sell millions of copies every single month, if they can't get something done with the existing resources, they have access to more resources if they need them. That is a valid concern, but I also think even with an unlimited budget and an unlimited number of talented people, it would be very hard to have a perfectly balanced game. And there are two crucial reasons Mojang can't do that even with the unlimited budget resources, uh, and especially they can't do it in the real world. One of these is that a perfectly balanced game isn't fun. Although I gave examples of how things are balanced, actually if you look at the horse versus the boat and the minecart, the horse is much better than a minecart in basically every single way. And then again, the boat is much better than a horse in basically every single way if you have a lot of ocean, which most worlds do, or you're willing to take a silk touch pickaxe and make an ice pathway for it, at which point it becomes the clear way to get around your world, your end, or even your never, which doesn't make any sense, but let's go with it. And so that is the truth, is that actual perfect game balance isn't fun. People prefer the system where minecarts are the fun kind of roller coaster on rail system, where the horse is much more powerful for that early game, and where the boat can be the really powerful end game mechanic. Obviously, this gets broken when we talk about the Elytra, which is on the list of things that are still uh, very much overpowered, which I won't dive into right now, uh, but instead I can say that actually having a perfectly balanced game isn't fun. People prefer a little bit of brokenness if there is still some trade-offs within it. Having one item be more powerful than the others is great if the other options have some value. Take, for example, the protection system. That is one where protection is just objectively the best, whereas if you look at sharpness versus smite, most players still use sharpness, but smite is pretty good. Ignore or Bane of Arthropods for this example, and then let's look at end potions, where the exact same thing is true. The best potions are much better than the weakest ones. I mean, seriously, invisibility is kind of a quirky, weird effect, while fire resistance literally allows you to avoid burning in lava.
cover. It's much better than fire protection, funnily enough, making another reason you would never use that enchantment, but the point of having perfect game balance would actually make Minecraft less fun. An example of this might be the many types of woods. Having three types of wood, or four types of wood, or six types of wood, or seven or eight, or any number of wood honestly doesn't add much more value to the game besides aesthetics, and so perfect balance isn't as fun there as when they make the never woods, which specifically can't burn and can't be used as furnace wood, and when they add bamboo, which is much easier to farm than every other type, this then makes the interesting decisions about how you actually want to use different types of wood, and that is my point about perfect game balance. Actually, good design balance is having things be a little bit broken, just not too much so. The problem with the bartering system is not that getting ender pearls is really, really handy, it's the fact that it was so handy that why would you go out there and experience the other new mechanic they just added, which is killing endermen in the new warp forest. And honestly, they did the same in the village and pillage update. They made trading for ender pearls such a valid tactic that no one would ever go out and kill real endermen anymore because it took literally 10 times longer, no matter how bad you were with trading. Having this as a skill-based mechanic can kind of make sense, but having some good game design balance, having ways that encourage you to learn more about the game and actually play it is generally a good thing. And so I think the other reason that you can't do it, it's not just because perfect game balance isn't desired or possible, it's because there's another thing to consider as a game gets older, and that is that the Minecraft player base starts to get used to things a certain way, as anyone who's still mining at Y13 can tell you. And so let's go into a full video that I actually prepared on this topic that I'll just make a part of this one right now. Here is game-changing Minecraft advice that used to work, but doesn't anymore. Hello, I'm Abyx Toycat, and has someone ever given you advice in Minecraft that turned out to be entirely false? This is not necessarily because they're nefariously minded, but instead because Minecraft has changed so much that things that used to be true now give you the exact opposite of good results, and so today I'll be going through a bunch of examples, but instead of it being a full video as it was going to be on this channel, let's make it instead a part of the important point about how Mojang finds it hard to nerf things, because advice like this goes from being really handy to being really, really harmful. So. For example, you might hear from people and a billion YouTube videos or guides or anyone that you speak to that the best layer to mine for diamonds at is Y13. If you try that in any update post Caves and Cliffs though, you'll end up exactly nowhere and although you won't find zero diamonds, you'll find so close to zero that it might as well be. The reason for this is because the bottom of the world isn't Y0 like it used to be maybe when you last played or they last played, but instead the bottom of the world is found at Y-64. And you can see the confusion there. Now, the best layers to mine diamonds for are either Y-57 for the most diamonds, or Y-53 for the most diamonds while avoiding lava, which is something important to know. It's also worth mentioning that you're not going to find any diamond ore, it's all deep slate diamond, um, which is obviously just like regular ores you can get with your regular pickaxe, uh, but it's surrounded by deep slate, which is what exists between Y-0 and Y-64. Deep slate ores are exactly like their regular counterparts, except for the fact that obviously if you haven't played Minecraft in a while, you might have, but you've got a silk touch pickaxe that you used to anyway, you might be used to picking up iron ore and gold ore with this, and you might think to yourself, oh yeah, I am excited to smelt this in a furnace, but this is now the wrong way to do things. I can smelt up, technically speaking, just like before, I can smelt up my deep slate gold into gold ingots, and I can smelt up my deep slate or my regular iron into regular iron, but this is not the best way of doing things. Let me show you instead the best way, because if you mine them with a, uh, a regular pickaxe first, um, I guess I can't do that with this one, if you mine these with a regular pickaxe first, something interesting will happen, which is that you'll get some iron as a result. This can go up with fortune, meaning the best way to get the most iron is instead to mine it into raw iron first, or at least not to waste your silk touch pickaxe on it. Obviously, the big exception to this is diamonds. Still smelt your diamonds in a furnace. This is just by far the best way to get them, and uh, it's definitely not a wasteful, inefficient way to do This is just, it's wonderful. Smelt your diamonds in a furnace like you've always been doing, um, because I mean, what does fortune do anyway? I, I don't need good fortune because I have a furnace. Damn it. Speaking of having good fortune, you can use this in lots of ways for lots of things, but the most interesting example people will tell you not to do once you have one of these is to waste this on a diamond hoe. Don't waste your diamonds on a hoe is very good advice for the real world, but no longer in Minecraft. That's right, wasting your diamonds on a hoe is a really good idea because although it might seem like it's just a way to farm because it used to be that way, now the hoe is actually a valuable material which is the fastest way to shear things like the hay bales or the 
the Never Warp blocks or all of these blocks on screen, which is very handy if you ask me. There's some really weird ones on there, isn't there? But with that said, um, if I use a sword to mine this block, it takes that long. If I use a pickaxe, it takes this long. And if I use the diamond hoe, it takes this long much, much, much faster, especially for the hay bales and for leafs and anything else like that. A hoe is actually worth wasting your diamonds on, which is crazy to say, but it is also true. By the way, something else that's crazy to say is that cobwebs used to be a really valuable thing to mine. You used to have to use silk touch to get them, but now you can just go ahead, you used to, you can just go ahead and you can use your shears and do that just great. So when people tell you need shears to mine uh, with a, uh, if you need silk touch to mine on your shears, that's inaccurate. However, something else they might tell you that's also inaccurate is that these cobwebs are a really great source of strength. If you wanted to, you used to be able to craft cobwebs into string, but they removed that recipe on bedrock for parity reasons. They, they, I, I, it's the weirdest part of parity for them to address first, but it's what they've done. And so instead, if you've got cobwebs, you can use them for precisely zero crafting recipes and maybe instead just use it to save your life. If you want to do an MLG bucket, this is one of the coolest ones. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it will get you murdered. And honestly, it's mostly just there to slow down people you don't like. But speaking of slowing down people I don't like, you might think, uh, you might, might have heard that the best way to stop water getting to you is using a torch or using a door. Although the door one still works on Java, the torch one is an old piece of Minecraft advice that worked because having a torch in a block would temporarily remove all of the lighting in that. However, now you can't place torches underwater. Wait, what a weird batch of... What a weird mineshaft this is. But you can't place torches underwater, as I'll show you right now. I'll place a block right there and try to place a torch on it. It will not physically let you. I can place it there, I can place it all the way around this thing, but I can't place a torch underwater, which means you'll drown if you follow this advice. Although you might want to drown when you learn what happens to the fastest way of mining. Uh, it used to be the fastest way to mine was to crawl into blocks just like so. And this is something, uh, you know, th th this is a very, very, very ineffective way of doing things. In reality, just dig down Y minus 57 or something. Honestly, there are so many pieces of advice that people will give you um, that are old school or they're old school rumors. And I think it's very important to keep an eye on the fact that these pieces of advice are shared from person to person and have a lot of wisdom in them, but also sometimes have a lot of fake news. So I think the easiest example of this would be uh, growing sugarcane. You can grow it on dirt or sand. A lot of people say it grows faster on sand. It does not. You can grow it on moss now too, and some people say it grows faster there because you might feel that it does, but it doesn't. And these pieces of advice get mixed in with ones that are old and you just don't know who to believe, but it's always just worth thinking to yourself, has this thing changed recently? But as players, let's be honest, we're not all doing that, which is where Mojang has a problem, which is how often should you break people's understanding of how Minecraft works? Where should people have to mine? Do they need to look it up every time just in case they've changed it? How do people barter with piglins? They have to look that up every time. What about trades with villagers? There have been multiple trade changes now, and I think this video has hopefully shown you, or this subsection of a video, this video in a video, this video section, has shown you quite clearly that if Mojang does make these huge alterations, it does have huge impacts on the advice that people give. Because, you know, you or I might be playing Minecraft quite regularly, but someone who hasn't played for years has no idea what a never update is, or what caves and cliffs even means, and might not even know this whole area exists, and so they might go mining at Y13 and just get really sad at the lack of diamonds. Should Mojang be really ruining existing player or rather old players times at the expense of existing players and or for the benefit of existing players that's a question i don't know if i can give you a decent answer to Speaking of difficult decisions, this video has clearly shown that Mojang will alter existing players' knowledge, even though it has these downsides, so why haven't they done it for the clearly most broken things in Minecraft, which actually, let's go through right now. So we've just gone through exactly how Mojang only has limited resources and they're very limited in how they can actually apply patches because they're trying to avoid Minecraft getting too different for people getting back into the game after a wave of nostalgia. So yet, yeah, how is it that they haven't fixed the most overpowered parts of the game? That's an interesting question that maybe you'll be able to answer as we go through the still very much OP parts of the game. Obviously, mending is up there. They're arguably trying to fix how you obtain mending, but the mending mechanic itself is so insanely 
insanely powerful because it means that while you're getting experience, as everyone is doing in Minecraft all the time, you are effectively able to skip the whole repairing mechanic in the game and can have your best armor, indeed Neverite, uh, work infinitely on it. I think this is a really interesting case of why they can't fix mending, but we'll get back to that while we mention all of these systems at the end because also firework rockets are very powerful. A lot of people think the Elytra is OP because obviously horses are a fair balance between the boat and the, uh, the minecart, but when it comes to the Elytra, it's just the only way to get around. It's so very, very, very powerful, you might think, but actually it's the firework rocket that has the brokenness to it and is indeed the part they try to fix. This is also something that definitely applies to structure loot. The easiest way to get diamonds by far in Minecraft is just find yourself a decent shipwreck, find yourself a decent jungle or desert temple. There are so many structures where you can just skip the whole mess of actually going through and playing Minecraft and just grab yourself some of that stuff right there. So these are the three most OP systems which exist as a whole and could easily be tweaked with some data values, yet to date Minecraft has not. And the reason why becomes clear as we take each of these three cases on one by one. The first is the case of mending, which was added as an example of a treasure enchantment, one you had to find in the wild, you couldn't manually enchant it, and so even though it was very powerful, it was balanced by being very rare. Then later on, presumably a different developer, in fact we can near guarantee it, added it as a trade that you could get from villagers, and then another update yet made it easier to refresh those villager trades so you could try over and over and over again to get it until you had mending tradable, and then there were all of the discounts that came as part of that update, making mending very obtainable for cheap, and then because mending was quite widely available, they added a new set of armor to the game, Neverite, which was kind of built under the assumption that you would already have maxed enchanted armor and then upgrade it to Neverite, which means that if you were to try and repair Neverite armor or tools naturally, you have to use Neverite ingots, which is so prohibitively expensive to mine for that no one would ever repair the normal way, and now they've built these entire systems which people are very reliant on, and the removal of mending at this point would effectively mean many people would only be able to use their Neverite in extreme circumstances, which would be a big downgrade in the Minecraft quality of life for people. Take for example the firework rockets. When these were added, they were literally the most valueless item in Minecraft. It's funny, I think I've made several most useless items in Minecraft videos, and the firework rockets always show up because even though they have these pretty aesthetics, it's something that means nothing on a single player world, and realistically even on other worlds, like how much are fireworks that exciting to be worth the crafting? They're a weird item that just got added as a fun, silly, goofy reward that you could craft if you wanted to. And so then, later on, uh, you know, Mojang is thinking about ways to make them more valuable, and after the Elytra is added, which is a fairly balanced form of transport by itself, it requires you to get up high and make these forms of infrastructure. It's kind of like a minecart, but you can go anywhere, but in exchange, you do have to have this permanent effect on your world. These big towers, which you basically require, and the fact that Elytras only have so much durability were the balancing factor on the Elytra. However, people worked out how to get around this by using punch bows on themselves. You could shoot an arrow and that arrow would hit you and you could use the punch effect which launched you very far to launch yourself around the world in an amazing way which is something they decided to fix by making, uh, you know, they, they had to fix the bug behind this because you shouldn't be able to shoot yourself while flying and so what they did instead is gave people fireworks. This seemed like an inconsequential thing at the time because how many people used fireworks? This was a great replacement for the mechanic but it seemed like not too much but combine the fireworks with the mending which people were just now rapidly getting on their Elytra and all of a sudden people can fly around the world infinitely just for having paper and gunpowder crafted together, which meant the people then went a lot more heavy on the paper and the gunpowder, which means that now everyone can fly anywhere in their world if you get to the late game. This is an insanely powerful system and it's such a shame because instead of using the firework rocket, I think a better balance would have been waiting until 1.13 uh, when the trident was added and the trident had a riptide effect. This could have been a fair replacement because riptiding into the air and then using a launch from there would have still required people to put water around their world, which would have still been a better alternative and a fairer alternative than the firework, but again, we'll we'll come back to what, what is responsible for that after we come into the final thing, structure loot. So structure loot is a classic case of Minecraft added a couple of interesting structures, and then they added a couple of more in the form of the desert and jungle temple, and then they added another one, and another one, and another one, and all of a sudden we've got 20 structures, but each of these structures when they were added needed to be entertaining in some way that you would want to go there. It can't just give you some paper, rotten flesh, and a piece of gunpowder and say, yeah, this is a great piece of loot. Instead, every single loot chest needs to be exciting, and especially it needs to be exciting even to 
existing Minecraft players. This leads to a little bit of power creep where every new structure needs to have such insane stuff in there that you'll really want to go to it. And I think this peaked with the Woodland Mansion giving you a literal totem that allows you to avoid death as well as diamonds and gold and all of the most valuable things you can imagine. You get it in insane quantities here while the Bastion gives you dozens of gold blocks in some cases as well as access to lots and lots of picklins. There are lots and lots of valuable things that they try to give you in new structures so you feel like you need to go there and we're seeing the same thing happen with the ancient city. They had to give a lot of loot to make people care and exclusive enchantment but even that wasn't enough so they've decided to double down and put mending in there as part of their solution for that. But all three of these cases have the exact same underlying problem and it's basically trying to solve problems from before. Something that could have been solved with a little bit of foresight is instead having to be jammed into an update and solved there before it's solved again a couple of updates later before all of a sudden they've got a much bigger problem on their hand. This is something that is inherent to I think any studio that gets really big all of a sudden and Minecraft has done that to an extreme level. A game that was developed by one person and then a small studio that could fit in a room and then a big studio that took up a large space of Stockholm and now hundreds and hundreds of people all around the world have to work on the same game and make it feel cohesive somehow. That is an insane challenge no matter how you put it and so if we take the mending example I believe it was Dinnerbone in the Frostburn update that decided they needed to have treasure enchantments. It might have been Jeb, it was one of the OGs of Minecraft and they balanced it very well for the time. Frostwalker and Mending were both specifically found by fishing and sometimes rare chests and so when you got these enchantments you got to do very very cool things. Then later on when they're rebalancing villagers, maybe just maybe, you sometimes find Mending as a part of that and it's a goofy small enough thing that who cares they can leave it in and then when they're revamping villagers and they discover that you can get Mending but it's really hard, someone says to themselves I can make villagers so much more appealing by putting Mending as a rare trade here. They think they've made it rare but another person who's working on villager trading makes it so you can reset the trades of a mob or at least makes it inherent in the mechanics that if you abuse it you can reset the trades of the mob and so now all of a sudden you've got yourself a Mending book which is readily obtainable and then someone else who works on the zombie curing mechanic makes it a lot easier if you were to do that and then someone else sees that mending is a part of the game that no one has fixed it for years now and when they're working on Neverite they don't think of an easier way to make that armor repairable you know they don't make it repairable with ancient scrap because why would they need to everyone's just putting mending on it regardless and now each of these five people have basically stepped on each other's toes building what they think they've made when in reality each of them had their own little vision I think the case of the uh, the Elytra and the firework rocket is the biggest example of this because when you look at the uh, the Elytra and the fact that if they'd have just waited two updates they would have had a really perfect solution to this that wouldn't require any nerfs or anything like that. The person who was working on the bug fix to make it so you couldn't shoot yourself with an arrow had no idea, I guarantee zero idea, that two updates from then there was going to be a trident that was found underwater and that trident was going to be rare enough that when you put a rare enchantment on it it would allow you to boost into the sky which would be player's choice method and they could just wait a little bit uh, and people would be mad right now but that would be fixed in a short while or they could bring forward the trident from that update to now. All these sorts of decisions that require foresight and knowing what's in the future don't work when you have staff turnover that means that literally every update is going to be some number of people's first update they're working on and also some number of people's last. There is such an amount of knowledge that will get lost between the cracks there and the structure loot is a great example of where if you are just making your new structure you can't rebalance all of the other structures around it, you can't fix that all of a sudden at once, so instead you just make your structure more powerful and then the next person who has a structure is like oh well to compete with these other ones we have to make our one and then at a certain point you have to throw people so many diamonds and enchantments and exclusive trinkets and a music disc and even then they won't go there until you make it the best way to find mending. Every single Minecraft system that doesn't seem like it fits with the previous Minecraft systems is almost certainly designed by a different team at a different time without too much knowledge of what the previous guys necessarily thought. This is where the genius idea comes in of having people who are specifically gameplay designers. The vanilla gameplay designers is a really smart idea that follows on from the concept that Jeb has, the Book of Jeb, rules that Minecraft must never break. You might have an intern who thinks that he should have guns to Minecraft and so instead of letting him make the decisions about what is added to the game, you have people who are specifically trying to make Minecraft feel more Minecrafty. They're working on game balance, they're working on all these things, but this is where the original problem comes back because now we have further abstracted not just the people who come up with the ideas that are going to own an update, but also 
though the people who are then ideering them out and balancing them are separate to the people who are actually putting them in the game. This is a, which again is separate to the people who market the game, which is separate to the people who then have to support the game later down the line with bug fixes and QA testing. This is a very natural consequence of big studios and it's why all of the resources have to be rearranged. It's why we don't have these fun, whimsical shots of developers sharing what they're working on on Twitter anymore because no one is really working on a major individual part of the update. You can't look at a major set of features and say this was done by this guy and so now everyone is working on these tiny, tiny little silos and ultimately doesn't really get to interact that much with everyone else and this is where the problem lies. When you get to a big level of organization, organizing people in the right way gets very, very challenging. Maybe that's why it's called an organization. If you think about basically any task, it really is not made much easier by having a bunch more people thrown at it and uh, the example that is given is how nine women can't make a baby in one month. You can make nine babies in nine months if you do your own separate thing, but working together isn't going to solve that there are just some things that have to happen after each other and the same is true for Minecraft updates. As each person's individual split of an update gets smaller, as their individual scope to improve gets smaller, it also means that the innovation you can see starts to decrease, but then also the amount you can have each part of the game cohesively fit with the rest starts to go down significantly. The person who's working on the color of water is nowhere near the person who's working on enchantment tables, so linking these two things together in goofy ways is impossible in a way that it just wasn't when it was one person. Minecraft can do much bigger projects at much bigger scales than was ever possible before, but it also comes at some cost, and this is the downside of moving to a large enterprise. I can just say, you know, speaking myself a little bit here, I uh, used to make these videos 100% myself, and I was really, really proud of it to a certain level. I thought that having anyone come in to help me would do nothing to help, and like, honestly, every YouTuber that was like a whole team, it just felt ungenuine. So I tried for as long as I could not to involve help here on my YouTube channel, and when I finally did, it was because someone was basically like, look, I will edit your videos, trust me, I got this, bro, and then they did a really good job, and I realized, wow, they can do the editing for me, which saves me time to do other stuff. However, after a while of letting them do some of the editing, I noticed that there were some things that I would include in edit that they just wouldn't, but also it would make a weird inconsistency between when I edited a video and when they did, so it made more sense to have them do all of the editing and me to check their work and to help them out with it instead, and in the same way, they would be like, oh yeah, I noticed in this video you were talking about this, it might be better if you do it like that. This kind of collaboration can really work, but it requires a lot of syncing on a level where you need to be able to talk about all sorts of arbitrary things. Harrison, who's been on this channel for a while, uh, can attribute the fact that like a lot of what we do is kind of having to talk about what we're both going to do ahead of time. It is a really, really tricky thing, which is why companies get so deep down the meeting rabbit hole of saying everyone must talk all the time about what they are doing, but having a hundred people does not mean you get a hundred people's worth of stuff done, it means you get maybe 80 people's worth of stuff done at best, it's just it means you can do much larger projects, which is why the Microsofts and the Netflixes and the Facebooks of the world have hundreds of thousands of employees, but also, what was the last major feature that Netflix added? Seriously, look up the employee count, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it right now actually. Uh, Netflix uh, employees, how many employees are there, and what was the, there was uh, uh, 12,800 employees. Jesus, what do they do? What was the last new feature that Netflix added? Could you try and explain to me in the slightest what 12,000 employees could do? You could have each of those 12,000 people bring one brick to work every day, and then within like a week, you would have enough bricks to build a whole house. You could send all of those people into like a stadium and it would get shut down for health and safety reasons. But anyway, with the Mojang example, there are hundreds of employees, uh, but within the gameplay teams, it's still fewer yet, but once they have decided, okay, it is worth doing this thing, it's worth spending the limited resources and time, it's worth altering the game in this fundamentally irreparable way, it's worth changing the tech tree of other items that get messed up with this, it still then comes down to the ultimate decision of what is fair. Getting a lot of people to agree on this is very, very hard, and so ultimately it ends up being a design by committee problem. If you have a lot of people in a room and you say, what is the fair way to do something, you usually get a very muted, yeah, I guess this is just about fine, and so you get these very micro changes which will make you question whether it's worth doing anything at all. How can you possibly nerf mending in such a way that it actually becomes balanced and you actually would want to use other enchantments, maybe unbreaking is more powerful or something else is more powerful, without adding entirely new content altogether or making sure it's so bad that people hate it. These are decisions which lots of people have to agree on and honestly when it comes to nerfs that is very very hard. When it comes to Minecraft with all of those decisions, it is so hard that it often just doesn't happen.
Balance in Minecraft is an incredibly sensitive subject. This is because the game has a delicate tech tree which has lots of nodes which connect to each other and altering any single one of these nodes is inherently altering all of the rest. When you make it easier to beat the game this way, you make it harder to beat the game this way and less likely that you would and ultimately when you look at all of these points combined it just makes it very easy to stick to the status quo that people know and so whenever a big nerf round is coming up and even when people are agree on it, if they can't come to an exact conclusion on how to do so that keeps people happy, it seems to revert back to nothing, which is why we see very few major nerfs of these big gameplay mechanics that are too tied into the rest, and which is why it's a very big challenge for Mojang to even release the things they do. I think that it's important as a result of knowing how hard it is to keep an open mind until we see lots of things in the update, but I also think it's important for Mojang to realize that if people have an instinctive clinginess to the things that they love, it's important important to sweeten the bargain. I think that after weakening something as major as trading or the Elytra, you need to offer something which balance this is out in people's mind and say yeah, in exchange for this nerf we add a new item over there so that people are excited to do this new thing while also accepting the current thing is still going to be great, just not as great as it once was. However, in the philosophy of many video games, the way that you make things better is not by nerfing existing things but just by making other alternatives and so should Minecraft instead just power creep their way out of all of these problems. They could make all of the structure loot so good that it's balanced together. They could wait, make firework rockets so good and horses so great and boats so incredible that each of them would be wonderful in their own right. This is a decision that I don't think I am qualified to make as someone who isn't in game design but it's one I am fascinated to see where they go with it and that is why just like the rest of you I watch every one of these balancing updates with bated breath on how Mojang best thinks they can improve things in the future. And so to answer the big question we have of the day, why does Mojang keep changing villages and why are they nerfing everything time after time after time despite the community not wanting it? It's because ultimately a game with better balance is a more fun game where you have more choices and if they can deliver on that they will have a great update. And if they can't deliver on it then we'll have another 1.9 split in the community which is exactly what we need right now, right? This has been the overarching deep dive into nerfs in Minecraft. I hope you all enjoyed it. The uh, the research and the going through everything did take my entire day today. It's 10.29 as I'm finishing this video. So I hope you enjoyed it. Please consider liking or subscribing if you really did. And uh, yeah, check out the rest of the videos. I cover all of the Minecraft update news as it's happening, as well as some other fun deep dives and guides into the game that you might enjoy if you like Minecraft. Because I like Minecraft, that's why I spoke about it for just over 40 minutes. Thank you for watching. I hope you all enjoyed, because I'll see you next time, unless I don't. Goodbye. So these cards, this one is like... This one shines, but if you look, this one's a common. Oh wait, this one's a common. And this one's this one's a common, and this one's a rare. Or a unique. So this is more powerful, but it's rarer. Well, this is more common to get. I don't think that fits anywhere in the video. I'm just letting you know. <laughs>